Yes, well, we began to discuss thought last night. Now, I know the way it's been going. And uh, perhaps we'll just ask uh, to see if there are some questions this morning for a few minutes and then go on from there. But if anybody wants to raise some questions about what came out last night. Well, we were saying that if there's any kind of resistance at all, it's a violence. It's a well, violence. That, yeah, well, resistance to thought, I say, is violence in the sense that uh, thought calls for uh, you know, being, seeing what it means and being sensitive to whether it is <coughs> coherent or not. And simply to resist it is a form of as uh, is an inappropriate use of force, you see. And do you, and, uh, uh, and the difficulty is that we often don't realize what the con what the whole of thought that it goes into feeling or I call it felt it goes into the state of the body it's projected into somebody else as an image or into the whole society so many, most of our social problems are due to thought and we use by, we use try to use force to solve them you see <laughs> and they never get solved <laughs> uh, so that's the general idea Force? You mean the force of thought? Well, we either use physical force in the case of many many cases, or we use uh, mental force. We use moral force. We use undo. Uh, we get we try to get across a strong feel, you know, a sense of overwhelmingness uh, emotionally. Somebody may put on an emotional display of force. Uh, somebody else may uh, use intellectual force to overwhelm somebody with arguments. <laughs> Or uh, moral force, <laughs> or, you know, various ways which don't meet the thought, but simply bring in some kind of force to push it aside or dismiss it, and that leaves the problem untouched. You see, that is, people then feel that they, you haven't listened, and they be, that gives rise to their violence. It becomes a, a spiral cycle. Of yeah, that's, yes, or else they accept it, but they feel still feel frustrated and they take it out on somebody else. You see, very often people feel very frustrated in society, but you won't make a violent reaction if you don't think you can use force, right? But it's still there, so you try to find somebody else on whom you can use force, right? Somebody weaker. I mean, that's a very common thing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, say people may take it out on children or on, on, people, on people who are not as strong as they are and so on. You see that you have. Whenever you use force to meet a problem arising in thought, then you have left. You haven't really solved it. You've left more problems, though the force may seem to succeed. Right? Is fear related to this force? Well, there will be fear. If you can't, if you don't have the power to exert force, then you will feel fear. Right? Now, if you feel frustrated and would like to use force, but you're afraid to use force, right? So you'll then be a, feel fear. You may project into the other person your own violence and be afraid of it. When you say your own violence, we were talking about the analogy of the TV screen and the flickering lights and yeah. there's no violence in there. So that's clearly an example of where the violence in me is projected on That's right. Can you say more about this violence Yes, well, in me? whenever you think of somebody who has been frustrating you or doing, some, doing you wrong, you may think of an image of him and you project it, all the bad things into the image and then you begin to think, you know, I've got to use force against that, right? <laughs> Is that clear? So, uh, uh, or else, if you can't do it, then you keep the image in yourself and you start attacking that image, right? <laughs> Is that clear? But then you're attacking yourself, you see, and you get trouble with your organ, you know, your heart or your stomach or... <laughs> Though it sounded like we have from ancient ancient times stored violence like on the disc, these programs. Yes, it's building up through the, the ancient times and perhaps from the beginning of civilization. You see, I think generally the evidence is there's always been some violence, but it ten, in the simple hunter gatherer groups, there wasn't a lot because there were only about 20 to 40 people living together and they all knew each other. They shared everything and there wasn't much occasion for violence. but except by fear of other groups, right? But uh, as we build big societies, uh, people don't know each other, and you've got to establish authority and fear. 
uh, see, the very existence of society is maintained by a kind of violence, right? <laughs> People didn't find any other way to do it, right? They may say they all agreed to do it, but the very fact that you've got the police and jails and so on shows behind it is a kind of violence, right? There was no need for that in groups of 20 to 40. <laughs> Uh, you have people, many more people breaking down mentally, you see, again, the greater stress. You have, uh, and then you built it up. As you built up wealth, somebody had to own it, other, you know, somebody had to run it. <laughs> you had to organize it and uh, you had to protect it with armies and uh, so on. And you had to have rules which were very rigid, right? <laughs> that, that implied a kind of violence, right? And no, then you had people discovered when they got metal weapons that they could conquer a lot of people. A few could conquer a lot. They could plunder them all and they could make slaves and they didn't have to work, you see, <laughs> with all that. Uh, you see, the technology brought in a lot of work uh, and then they didn't have to do it, right? And, uh, but then that was extreme violence and also violence to the mind because they had to uh, say that... Uh, it was right to make slavery. There were those people, it was the right natural condition that there must be slaves and so on. It was inevitable, you know, morally right and so on. <laughs> and they made all sorts of arguments saying those people deserve to be slaves, they're inferior. <laughs> they lost the war, you see. <laughs> and then usually what happened was after a little while, new people came along with better weapons and horses and took over and they became slaves and <laughs> it went on and on, you see. so. This build up great violence with that general pattern has not changed, you see. Uh, it has sometimes gotten better and sometimes worse, but basically the authority of society has been, always had behind it violence, right? <laughs> We've not, never managed to make a society since the primitive times which didn't have violence as the ultimate uh, uh, thing behind the, the order of society, right? And also the violence between social groups, right? Uh, so uh, we haven't solved the problem. You see that the thought that violence arises primarily in thought, but people then think that it arises because of instincts of aggression and so on, which complicates things again. You see, there's no evidence that the instincts for aggression were that powerful in, in very early primitive times as they are now. Right? <laughs> there's this constant frustration and constant fear, and you know. Or using violence to get ahead, you know, that the basic relationships were involved violence right, of one kind or another. In other words, uh, people competing with each other and so on. Uh, well, see, the human nervous system was not really built for that. <laughs> I mean, we had a million years without that and then 5,000 years with that. <laughs> uh, <coughs> now, uh, so, I think it's worth considering violence as a, one of the basic things that has gone wrong with thought, right? Or thought itself has introduced it because it hasn't solved the problem of how to bring about human relationships in a large society. <laughs> you know, orderly human relationships, uh, purely on the basis of mutual understanding and friendship and <laughs> so on, right? Where in, in these small groups, that was more or less, they could have quarrels and so on, and they might separate, but that was the basic way it held together. Did you say that rules and laws are an expression of the violence? Yes, it's an expression. Of, some rules are necessary, but the kind of rules that were developed, which had to induce, there were very rigid rules, inhuman, they brought in fear, and so on. They couldn't get people to follow these rules without fear, right? They had to bring in fear, and that, that would bring in violence, right? In fact, it was only the threat of violence would ultimately sustain the fear. <laughs> See? See? That society has not managed to function without that, right? And then if not fear of the police there would, or the king, there would be fear of God, right? <clears throat> well, we have structure without violence. Well, that's, our, that's what we're exploring. I'm saying we have to have it if we're going to survive. <laughs> We, uh, we, I, I think it's possible myself, but we must explore it, right? It seems like once we, once there is any kind of set structure, that will violate um, something. Well, not if we see the necessity of it. You see, uh, people can agree that we're going to meet at a certain time, you see. We agreed this morning, right? 
uh, it does not necessarily a form of violence. We all saw the necessity of doing that. If we don't meet together, then it won't work, right? Now, people then have to be sensitive and ready to do it, you see, but uh, uh, to put that first, right? Hmm. Now, they may instead put some other interest first. You see, uh, we don't get it straight, you see. Now, uh, in this general atmosphere in which everything is organized by violence, it's hard to imagine how things could go otherwise, but I think they could, you see. We want to explore that, though. There's tremendous structure in nature and the human yeah. body, and that's not violent. Uh, the human body, though, is, is a very violent affair. It's constantly warfare, and in order to, to consume anything, it has to be completely destroyed first by the digestive system, so it's all violent. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not clear whether that's violence. You see, I think uh, it would not... Uh, there is such a thing as the undue use of force, you see, saying that... That, that kind of thing, at least, uh, is conducive to survival, but the kind of force we're talking about is going to end up in a great deal of unhappiness and destruction. <laughs> you know, this force which we're, by which society maintains itself. You see, uh, I think that uh, it would be po pos If we had small groups of people, we could live fairly peaceably, uh, groups of 20 to 40. But could we anymore? I mean, I'm just... No, not now, not now. Oh, well, yeah, but not not now. I'm saying that if, if you went back to those early conditions where you didn't have complicated ways of getting food, you went out, people spent 15, 20 hours a week gathering food or hunting, or, and, uh, you know, and uh, they would prepare food in common and so on. You see, uh, uh, it was a comparatively, as if there was plenty of food around, then it was fairly easy. I mean, and so sometimes, of course, there was starvation and they had trouble, but... It wasn't always perfect, you see, but uh, there's a book, I can't remember, that's just come out showing that there's no sign that the health of human beings got better when civilization began. On the whole, it got worse. <laughs> it's only recently that it's gotten better with you know, uh, more sanitation and medical science and so on. But uh, the, uh, Well, uh, I think we should now uh, focus, though, on the violence as, as originating in thought. You see... Part of the reason we haven't been dealing with violence properly is that people have said either that it's due to natural instincts like aggression or that it's somehow built into people. That, uh, you know, they're, they're given, I think, what are wrong explanations of the origin of violence and therefore we will not be dealing with it, right? <laughs> properly. Mm. Could we say that there is no violence outside of thought, that that action which takes place outside of thought, yeah. to use another term, Destroy, but it's not yeah, well, in natural destruction, I wouldn't call it violence. You see, say if, the, if there's an earthquake, it's not violence. It's, uh, you know, if, you know, whatever, floods, <laughs> the uh, uh, wind storms and all that. But uh, they may look like violence, and poetically we could call it violence, but it's not the same thing. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, that there's an inherent incoherence in this, see, uh, in this violence which arises in thought, and the, uh, which doesn't really attain its objective, and eventually it, 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 it creates tremendous disorder and unhappiness and so on, and uh, destruction. Now, uh, I think then for the thing we want to focus on is that thought, the, the kind of violence we're talking about, anyway, is, originates in thought, and people have not paid enough atten much attention to that. They have not really thought about it that way, right? Hmm. Uh, so, uh, uh, therefore, you see, dealing with violence, they might try to punish it or uh, try to re entice people into not being violent or saying you shouldn't be violent to, to oppose it. Or You see, none of that will work because it's the wrong notion of what's the cause of it, right? Now, therefore, we really have to get into thought, and the violence of thought is very subtle. It's not just physical violence, um, emotional violence. It's uh, very subtle violence in uh, the way people think and exclude, you know, the way they uh, reject each other uh, in certain ways by just thinking <laughs> and so on. Hmm. Now, yeah? Isn't that the violence that arises in our thoughts 
is a response to the kinds of conflicts that we feel within ourselves because of conditioning, a conflict between, I was thinking of the girl you talked about last night who thought her teacher's behavior was bizarre, but her parents uh, gave her a response that wanted her to discount the, um, the, the her own senses and to deny that she was experiencing uh, weirdness from her teacher <clears throat> and that would give her a conflict between should she believe her own observations or should she just follow along with the with the dictates of, of the authorities to just ignore that and, and, and go on anyway. And when you have so much of that when you're growing up, you, 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 you're in constant conflict with yourself and respond by being violent to yourself many times. That's true, yeah. Self-destructive behavior, and then projecting that in your outside relationships. Well, that's the further unfolding of violence. You see, uh, it all originates in thought. You see, the teacher was doing what she was doing because she had been conditioned to think in a certain way that this was right, or that it was the right way. And, uh, uh, and so it, it, and then you begin to think, well, this doesn't make sense, and somebody else says, ignore the fact that it doesn't make sense. Begin with understanding that, that the conflict is there. I mean, sometimes we think that's a normal state to feel pulled this way and feel pulled that way, and then to respond with craziness because if you're going to understand the conflict and resolve it peacefully within yourself, you wouldn't need to be violent toward yourself, and you would begin to unlearn the, the violent yeah. responses. But the conflict is due to your way of thinking. You have two thoughts, one of them being uh, what that uh, I, what the teacher is doing doesn't make sense, and the other that I, uh, that I must keep quiet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, th this produces two different uh, uh, impulses which are fighting each other. Now, if you clear it up and say, okay, I know I can't change the teacher, but I'm not going to get into a fight in myself. If you can carry it that far, okay. But I think what we're, I'm trying to say is I'm interested in something deeper, which is the whole process of thought as it produces violence and conflict right? all through society and over the ages, you see. That's only an example. Right? Hmm. All right. Now, so I think that uh, see, uh, we won't solve this thing by looking at particular examples. You see, maybe that person would feel a little better, but <laughs> it still will be going on all over, and uh, the whole process in general, will, this vast uh, thing will be flowing. Right? So uh, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, we have to look at the thing more deeply and more generally. And, the, uh, and in order to do that, I think we have to understand something of the nature of thought, you see. We pay very little attention to that generally in our culture over the past few thousand years. Now, uh, the, uh, hmm. so, uh, yes, and now, uh, I think we have to ask the question, what do we mean by thought, right? What is it? <laughs> I've already said it's the response of memory as there's thinking and there's thought. Memory, having put down a program, memory responds either with feelings or with actions or with words, right? Say if somebody asks you your name, you respond right away. It's on your memory. If, if you have a more difficult question, you have to search the memory or you ask somebody else or you look it up in a book. And if it's still more difficult, you can't solve it, you begin to say it's a problem, I must think about it. <laughs> And in a problem, you set a goal. You say, I, must, I want to do something, and I don't know how to do it. Like, I, I may have to get home, and I haven't got the means, and I try to discover the means, right? So in a problem, your thinking is generally directed toward a goal which is already pre-selected, you see. That is, your thought has told you that uh, your difficulty could be solved if you could get X, and you only have to find X, right? <laughs> but then that's still caught in thought. It's, it's somewhat more active than just uh, automatic thinking, but uh, it may be that the goal you're set to solve the problem is irrelevant or even part of the, the difficulty, right? <laughs> you see. In other words, the automatic acceptance of the problem is part of the, is, is the, maybe the main problem. <laughs> uh, that 
we have to say we, we can't accept the goals which are in our problems, you see, you see what I mean? Because they presuppose the things that are wrong. Hmm? Is that clear what I mean? So it's a deeper kind of question is involved. You have to question the whole kind of thought, which means slowing it down, right? Hmm? If you question things, your thought starts to slow down. Uh, you make the analogy of a wheel going very fast, you can't see the spokes. As it slows down, you see how it works, right? The gears work. <laughs> So you could say the wheels of the mind are working slowed down so that you can see how they're going, right? You see how they're generating this difficulty, right? That would be one view. Our, ordinarily, we, our mind goes very fast. It, the memory responds very, very fast and sometimes with emotions even faster, right? And uh, uh, you can't really see what it is and it goes so fast that you take it for independent reality. You see, this is one of the difficulties that thought does something and then says this result was not produced by thought. We went into that. It was just independent reality and we've got to think about it. But as we think about it, we keep it going, right? So, and therefore, uh, we now, while we keep it going, we're trying to solve it. <laughs> Whereas if... When you say slow it down, do you mean slow it down? And if so, what's doing the slowing down? I mean, well, just raising the question will slow it down. You see, if you're very sure of yourself, your mind goes very fast. If you begin to feel, I'm not so sure, you know, it's not clear, then it begins to slow down. The thoughts begin to slow down, right? Now, in some sense, the mind may be speeding up, right? Your attention may be speeding up while your thoughts slow down. Hmm? Hmm? You're more attentive, more aware. Hmm? When you're going very fast, you're not very aware, right? It's a relative thing then? To you, they're slowing down. I mean, the, the, is it, are we talking about time right now? Well, yes, it ta you're not getting so many thoughts so fast, right? If you're, suppose, for example, you're in a panic, your thoughts come in one after another, they're too fast, right? If you could slow them down, you might get out of it. Hmm? You know, now, because you could see what's going on. Hmm? So, uh, uh, sim or, 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 or no matter what it is, you see, when, when thought wor the program is working very fast and you can't see that it's a program, but you see it as reality itself, right? And therefore, you're trying to solve this apparent reality, which is really a program. You should be, uh, you should be uh, removing that program, but instead you keep it going and try to deal with its results. You see, that's been the whole history of humanity, right? That's looking at the program. Well, we'll, we'll raise that. Uh, if we could raise that question later. You see, that's a very subtle question, and uh, I think that if we get into it too fast, uh, it won't be clear. Right? You know, we have to get some idea of the nature of thought before we could properly raise the question. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, the. Um, uh, because we have to ask, what does it mean to perceive and so on? Hmm. Now, you see, there's a difference between think, thought and perception. For example, if we see sense, with the senses what is in the room, that gives information that doesn't come only from the memory, right? We, now, generally, our consciousness is the fusion of both kinds of information, information from the senses and information from the memory, from the past, right? So I recognize this as a table. It's the two together, right? It could be recognized as a flat bit of wood with, you know, with sticks, <laughs> perpendicular sticks. You know, there are various ways, right? Uh, uh, this could be a, potentially a piece of firewood, or uh, uh, there are all sorts of ways of seeing it, right? Uh, but uh, the memory it tells you this is a table, and you know immediately you can put something on it, right? <laughs> and so on. Now, uh, therefore, that's the fusion of the senses and the past, right? <laughs> now then. Okay, so now, but also we have uh, perception through the mind. We can sense when thought is not working right. We discussed that yesterday when it's incoherent, right? And we can sense that things are related or unrelated and so on. There are various ways, things we can sense which are not sensed directly through the eyes and ears and nose and touch and so on. Uh, we, we sense relationship, right? Hmm. Or non-relationship, separation, union, and so on. Uh, so that also enters into everything you perceive, right? See, what you perceive is the fusion of all that, right? Hmm? Now, that raises the question, you see, we could call this what is present, you see, in, a, in consciousness or awareness. 
Now, present has a root priya essent, meaning in front of. You see, it's sort of in front of you. <laughs> That's a sort of a metaphor. Uh, it's presented. <laughs> the, this whole net result of thought, per, sense perception, and perception through the mind is presented to consciousness, fused into one picture <laughs> or one uh, experience. Hmm? Uh, and uh, that experience may contain a lot of false features because the past, you could make a mistake in perception, and also the past comes in with wrong, uh, with some wrong inferences. You know? you know, it might tell you this is tables of this kind, you know, are always can be trusted, but they might not be, and so on. You know, you could, you see, you walk on the floor and you are confident it will support you. That's the past tells you that, but if there were an earthquake, it wouldn't work, you see. So, <laughs> the, uh, uh, it's not always, you see. So, the, uh, 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 but still, you need that confidence to be able to uh, depend on things you know to be able to live. Right? Mm. So, it should be presented to you as being really there, though, though it may not be there. Right? <laughs> but if it's not there, you, if you're, you should be able to discover it with your senses and with the sensitivity of the mind, huh? mm. and then change your thoughts. Huh? That would be the normal right way to do it. And, but then if your thoughts get stuck, you can't change it, right? You now if you believe, if you're identified with them, <laughs> say, I can't change them, then, uh, you, then you get into incoherence. Hmm? All right, so that, that's part of the general picture. You see, now, I think that it's useful now to think not only of what is presented, but of the word immediate. You see, there is that which is immediate. We can't really describe it. <laughs> And then thought mediates, it comes in between, right? It, it, it takes time for thought to work, thinking to work. It mediates, right? And then that thought is, comes out in the immediate again, right? Because you immediately sense this is a table without having to think, right? All the thought thinking you did before does that. Hmm? So do you see that thinking mediates perception and then re-enters the, the immediate, right? or at least uh, call it uh, relatively immediate. Hmm. Hmm. Is that? Can you repeat that again, please? What? Can you just go over that again? Yeah. You see, uh, 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 yes, thinking. I see, there was once a case uh, somebody told me about it. If you think of a person who has been born blind, for example, and he has an operation to see, then he doesn't actually see a great deal. <laughs> he has to get a lot of experience and memories and, and skills in order to see. <laughs> Uh, right? He, for example, he doesn't understand depth. If he sees a set of stairs, he doesn't see them going up, right? Uh, it may take him years to see that. So it may be easier for him to close his eyes in the beginning <coughs> and go by touch, right? But the things... Hmm. And he might see in a way that we don't see, you know, because we, we store it so much in our brain that we don't well, yeah. see things. He may, but if he wants to get around, he can't do it, you see. Hmm. And, and you see, that the... Uh, there was a case, well, one case of a man who was born blind, and they asked him, what did he see? And he says, oh, I see, the experience is, uh, is taking place on my skin. <laughs> so he actually <laughs> saw it directly. <laughs> uh, then he had to learn to project it out there, right? <laughs> hmm? <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, there was another case of a man who was in some institution in the and he, they had uppercase letters embossed on the door, so he knew them by touch. Now, the minute he saw them in a journal, he recognized uppercase letters, right? But he couldn't recognize lowercase letters, <laughs> you see, because the touch and sight get connected, right? Mm -hmm. So all that has to be learned and stored up in skill and memory, you see. Hmm. So the same is true of learning how to hear, and you have to learn how to hear, learn that what you hear and what you see have the same source. Like if you look at somebody, you say the person that you hear is the same as the person that you see. I imagine a blind man might have to learn that, <laughs> and uh, the uh, uh, and so on. Now, uh, so uh, that, that illustrates something that we learn mostly as children uh, when we were very young: that uh, what we see is tremendously affected by what we have learned and how we think about it, right? What people tell us. You see, and, and in fact, that's necessary if we're going to be able to get around <laughs> because we can't stop to think about anything. And then that can go wrong, but then we have ways of correcting it, you see, if it's not quite right. Now, okay, 
so, but then we have said that what thought mediates, it comes between you and the perception. You see, in fact, you might say with this man who saw, who experienced something on his skin, <laughs> that was very immediate. <laughs> and then he learned, he began to think about it, what does it mean? <laughs> And he must perhaps he learned gradually to mediate it and then to sense immediately that it means something out there. Not, not that he has to think, I experienced something here, but it means something out there. <laughs> but he experiences something out there. You see that you see the difference, huh? So that's what we've learned all along, and we have to have it, right? But that can also go wrong. Hmm? Because we may not realize it's happening, you see. Hmm? Now we learn that that person is an enemy, we experience it, that. Uh, we learn all sorts of things of that too, right? <laughs> that nature. You know, we learn that we're weak and they're strong, you know. <laughs> the child learns you know, all that sort of thing. <laughs> he experiences himself as weak, right? <laughs> Even about the uh, you know, tangible things like the room, in some sense, aren't we wrong right from the beginning in the sense that uh, the experience is absolute? In other words, our feeling of it is not a relative room to us, but it's a real room to us. Well, we experience it as really being there. And I think uh, uh, that there is danger there of slipping over. And it's not a serious error at that point, but it can, as we move into more subtle questions, it slips into something very serious. Right? Uh, <clears throat> now, because usually you can tell fairly quickly when you've gone wrong about the room, you see, from your senses. But when we come to ourselves and our country and our society, <laughs> it's not so easy. Huh? Because we experience our society in that way too, you see. In fact, where is society? It's nowhere, you see. <laughs> There's no society really. <laughs> it's just a set of institutions and rules and so on by which people agree to work together, but live together. But uh, it's, it's only thought that makes it so, right? <laughs> uh, you see, if... Uh, Every, General Motors is a company which everybody agrees must be doing all sorts of things, but if they forgot about it, then it wouldn't exist. All the factories and machinery and so on would make no difference. Right? You see, uh, the same with any uh, government or, uh, you know, or organization or anything. Right? So uh, the whole thing exists in thought, and where is that? It's in, not in any, you know, it's in the thought, collective thought. It's not just the thought of one person. And <coughs> the, uh, uh, so, uh, there we see that thought has produced most of what is there. <coughs> uh, thought has produced a great deal of what is here, but it has some independent existence. Uh, uh, the mountain thought did not produce, but it may have affected it. Uh, the, uh, uh, but uh, the, the society thought produced, you see, but we seldom treat it that way, you see. We treat it as just there, you see. So thought, that's what thought is constantly doing, doing things and then saying, there it is, right? <clears throat> and keeping it going and saying, what, what can I do about it? Uh, so, uh, uh, okay, so you have the immediate mediated by thought, but the mediation becomes at least relatively immediate, right? It may not be the pure immediate but, uh, that the blind man had, <clears throat> but it was almost pure anyway. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the, uh, uh, that's the first point, you see. Now, <clears throat> uh, the second point about thought is that it is an abstraction. Now, the word abstract means to take away, you see, like, like extract, abstract. Uh, you, thought takes, uh, the opposite of the abstract is the concrete. From the concrete, whole thought takes away certain parts and considers them, right, mentally. And not really, it doesn't take them away, but in, in the mind, right, in the image. And that is useful because you can then focus on things that might be important. You see, there's too much in the concrete to think about, right? Uh, you focus on what you think is important and you can then do reasoning. You see, if it's simple, you can reason about it. If it has everything in it, you can't, huh? You see, so you must abstract, right? Uh, so thought is inherently abstract. Some thoughts are more abstract than others. You see, we could take the thought of the chair, the thought of the table, the thought of various other things, you know, uh, uh, and then a more abstract general thought would be the thought of furniture, right? <laughs> you see, furniture is somewhat more abstract than chairs and tables, 
But even chairs and tables are an abstraction. As kind of, I said, you can look at this as a piece of metal or in all sorts of ways. Uh, now, so you have the abstract. And a thought is inherently abstract. And abstraction is very powerful. You see, for example, the notion of growth is an abstraction. If you will know, nowhere in the concrete will you see growth, right? <laughs> look for growth. You can see something's growing. <laughs> but I talk about economic growth, you see. So where will you see it, right? <laughs> uh, now, but the very notion of growth has affected our society profoundly, right? It has produced all sorts of concrete effects. Huh? <coughs> you see, so the function of, yes, so, so thought produces abstractions, which however have concrete results. Huh? Now that brings us to the concrete. See, what is that? <laughs> Because you have to understand the difference of the abstract and the concrete if we're going to understand what thought is doing. Now, the word concrete has a nice derivation. It's based on concrescent, which means grown together. <laughs> you know, you imagine a jungle, everything is all grown together, it's all one whole. And you may have to abstract from there, you know, what are the edible plants and what is, <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> you see. <laughs> Uh, if we went into the jungle, we couldn't do it. We wouldn't survive. Those who have lived there all their lives make that abstraction easily, <laughs> and they can survive, right? <coughs> so, <coughs> the uh, <coughs> uh, now, uh, so the, the, the point now, everybody now, but now this word concrete. I think we, I'm going to try to suggest a, an extension of its meaning. You see, I think to be free, to be creative, we must not. We cannot always stick to all the customary habitual meanings right, of words, because if we do that, we will never get out of a certain limited area. <coughs> uh, meanings are constantly being extended. Even in physics, we, there was an ordinary meaning of the word energy, and people extended it to a certain technical meaning, <laughs> quite different from the meaning it has in ordinary life, and so on. Now, uh, the uh, uh, so. Uh, now, ordinarily, we think of concrete as something very solid because we have concrete <laughs> objects, <laughs> you know, blocks of concrete. <laughs> uh, now, but it's interesting to look at the, the, the derivation of the word concrete is from concrescent. Uh, it has grown together. And you see, actually, it's the cement that makes, the con makes it concrete. Right? <laughs> you have sand and rock, pebbles, and the cement holds it into a block of concrete. <laughs> you see, in fact, that was originally, it was. Um, Portland cement, let's see, was what made it concrete, right? Now, <clears throat> you see, so we tend to think of this block as the main point about concreteness, but the main point about concreteness is the cement that makes it all one, right? And so, okay, well, in the case of uh, concrete blocks, the cement is Portland cement that makes a block, but what holds us, to, what holds society together? What holds people together, you see? <laughs> what is the concrete reality of society? You see, where is the block? <laughs> you see, it's something very subtle. It's the exchange, the sharing of meaning, right? If people don't sh have, share the similar meaning, <coughs> society falls apart, right? Hmm? So the concrete reality of society is very subtle. If we focus on the solid block, we won't find it. See, the buildings, the factories, and all that are not the concrete reality of society. I've, we've just seen that, right? <coughs> With the, the, they're the pebbles and the sand. <laughs> Uh, it falls apart without the cement, right? <laughs> so the um, uh, without the glue or the cement, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so the the point is the sharing of meaning is the uh, is what holds society together, if it does. But if the meanings are incoherent, they will, society will break up, right? <laughs> Same as saying that the glue of society is the abstract, or is that uh, no? Theory? It's it's. I'm going to come to that. I, I'm going to say it's subtle. That's all I've said so far. I can't get put my finger on the block of concrete we can hold in our hands, right? It's what's called manifest. Manifest means literally in Latin what you could hold in your hand, right? <laughs> now, but it isn't man the thing that holds society together isn't manifest. You can't put it in your hand, right? The things you can put in your hand won't hold society together. So the uh, uh, now, uh, so what is the nature? You raised the question. What is the nature of this subtle concrete uh, uh, glue, <laughs> cement? Right? So the uh, uh, 
I'm, I'm going to suggest now you have raised the question. I say sharing a meaning, right? So I'm saying the concrete basis of society is this meaning, whatever meaning is. Now, meaning is, is, is not just abstract. You see, behind meaning is something concrete, I want to say, the concrete reality of say, thought itself or of the mind process itself, right? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Is that clear what I mean? That, uh, 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 so behind that is meaning, right? Now, uh, or in an elementary case, it's thought which has a certain meaning, uh, uh, words which have a certain meaning, <coughs> but it more, there may be more subtle meanings. Right? Uh, For, let's say, a table, for an individual, the the concrete reality is the meaning. The meaning is, in a sense, what the table is, what it represents to him. Yes, and also the meaning of the whole room is what holds it all together. The meaning of your life is what would hold it together. Right? Hmm? See, if it lacks that meaning, then you feel it's falling apart, right? Yeah. If society lacks a common meaning, it's not holding, right? Or the culture lacks it, right? Hmm. Now you see, culture is the shared meaning, right? Hmm. And now meaning includes not only significance, which you know what that is, uh, but also value and purpose. These are the three meanings of the word meaning, right? Uh, so you see, the, the, the sharing of common significance, value, and purpose will hold the society together, right? If, it's inco if they don't share it, it's incoherent and it goes apart. Now, we have a lot of subgroups in our society that don't share meanings, and it starts to fall apart, you see. It's almost sounds, hope I don't hear, it's almost sounds too mechanical Why? that that, uh, that these things actually can hold society together. It, it sounds like they couldn't really. Why not? Well, it would seem like the thing that would hold the society together would be not, it wouldn't be a thing. There's nothing you could... Why? Yeah, but meaning is not a thing. So you can't point to the meaning, it's very subtle. Right. But then you say shared values? Well, that's some of the aspects of meaning. You see, if we want to say what the meaning itself, the concrete reality of the meaning, we can't uh, get hold of, right? But we can experience it in th various forms, like the, the, the significance, the value, and the purpose, right? You see, if we share meanings, then we will have a common purpose and a common value, which certainly will help hold us together. Now, but that, what that means more deeply, we have to go into. Hmm? But hmm. is the difference between significance, the value, and purpose important for this discussion? If so, could you? Uh, well, there's not a fundamental that? difference. There are really different aspects of the same thing, right? That uh, the uh, there are three. The dictionary gives these three meanings of the word meaning, right? Now. Significance has the word sign in, it sort of points to something. You see, what is the significance of this, uh, what we're talking about, right? That's one idea of meaning, hmm? is that clear? Uh, what is the significance of uh, what we're doing and all that? Now, but then value is something which is uh, uh, part of it. If something is very significant, you may sense it as having a high value, right? Now, the word value has a root which is interesting, the same as valor and valley, and it means strong. You might have supposed that in early times when people sensed something of high value, they didn't have a word for it, but it moved them right, strongly. Later they found a word for it and said it has high value, and then later the word itself may convey that. <coughs> now, the, uh, uh, and then if, if something is significant, it may have a high value, and if it has a high value, you may have develop a strong uh, purpose or intention to, to get it or sustain it or something, right? Things that don't have high value will not generate any very strong purpose. You see, hmm? so you say it, it's not interesting. <laughs> hmm? Hmm? It doesn't mean much to me. Right? Hmm? It means a lot to me. It means it has a high value, and I mean to do it is the same as to say it's my purpose. Right? So you can see the word meaning has those three meanings, and I don't think it's an accident. I think they're in, in very deeply related. sense that I sometimes have that we pretend to share meaning. Is that because there's a higher 
value that we have to get along? Because oftentimes I feel we just pretend. That well, we yeah, we may share. pretend to share, which means it won't work. I mean, but then we are. We say it's it's very important for us to not to fall apart, so we'd better share, right? <laughs> To hold this thing together. Yeah, but then it doesn't really work because uh, says it will be, then be a kind of violence trying to impose some sharing which is not there, right? Mm -hmm. You see, we may then, if it isn't working, we are inclined to go into some use force, right? When, when the right way isn't working, then we fall back to force, right? Hmm. One of the shared meanings that we, you're saying that the shared meaning is incoherent. It becomes, and, yeah. And one of the shared meanings we have is that we all believe in violence. Yes, uh, we, we share that, but we... The, 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 but the kind of meaning that we've shared is not going to bring about coherence. That we share incoherence, it doesn't... <laughs> it's a kind of paradox. <laughs> violence is the way in which we try to enforce this incoherence. Yeah, it. yeah. So what we share is not the right thing to share. You see, we, True sharing must be coherent, right? You use the word right thing, right way, several times now, and that's what always confuses me, because I've always assumed that the right way is a relative's term in every culture. And yes. how does one decide what is the right way? Yes, yes. Uh, well, that would be an assumption that that's always the case. You see, maybe it's often the case, what you said. Is it not the case? Well, just simply right now and what you said. You see, you questioned something I said, right? You were implying that in your questioning was the right question, not relative. No, I don't understand Well, that. you see, what was the meaning I'm, of it? I'm, 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 um, I want clarification. Yeah, but what was the meaning of your question? That I don't understand your use of the term right at this point yeah. in discussing uh, Yeah. Significance and value. Yeah. Are you suggesting that my use of the term right is not right? I'm suggesting that I don't understand <clears throat> yeah. how to use it, and I would like you to clarify. Yeah. Well, do you sense something wrong with the way I'm using it? Does it, does it jar you in some way? <coughs> yes, because you've been talking about openness, openness, yeah. and then you use the word right, and that seems to me yeah. um, not congruent. Yes, all right, well, uh, we'll use another word, but uh, see, I think I wanted to bring in another issue at the same time, but let's, uh, uh, what I only meant by the word right is exactly what you meant by the word openness, because, you see, you are using the word openness in the sense that that is what would be the right way, you see. Uh, the, uh, you see, I, I don't think we can entirely get out of the use of the word right. You see, I think that's one of those paradoxes of language, that when we try to say something is always the case, we get into problems of coherence. So we have to leave open a little bit, right? <laughs> we brought in openness, and even openness could get to be wrong, right? <laughs> could get to... <laughs> so it, it requires a sensitivity and, a, uh, and, and so on. So uh, I can say, okay, you can object to my use of the word right, but you must realize that you still have that same problem. <laughs> and uh, we have the problem that we are going to have to be sensitive to the use of language, right? Uh, that we are not that when we get into the use of absolutes, we get into difficulties. That, but if we say never use absolutes, we are in total difficulty. <laughs> uh, so uh, we, our language itself has paradoxical features, which we should have to, which we really have to think about. Right? Wouldn't the, wouldn't the difficulty only arise if we believed in the language? Yes. Well, we have to say take our language with a grain of salt, as they say. You see, uh, or maybe two. <laughs> well, I guess I was basically pressing you for the root evaluation. Yeah, well, I think values arise as a perception deeply, a sense that this uh, means something to me. A meaning is perceived fundamentally, you see. Uh, it's a perception through the mind which takes, uses the senses and thought and everything. And I can't say, see, meaning is very close to the foundation of the mind, right? And uh, somehow we can perceive meaning or we can also take meaning from the past, from thought. Say, you know, and we can bring the two together and so on. Now, we have to have coherent meaning, you see. You see, when coherent thought is only a part of the question of coherent meaning, because from the meaning we act, right? And the meaning determines our whole being. Because as things mean something different, 
uh, we change, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if our meaning is incoherent, then we are incoherent in our being. Uh, we will be engaged in conflict and so on, I see. So uh, now the language itself has a certain possibility for incoherence, which is part of the reason why the human species is in trouble. <laughs> that people trying to do the right thing, <laughs> just uh, so-and-so, have got into this absolute and done the wrong thing, right? <laughs> you see, uh, so there's a kind of paradox there that requires some sensitivity. Uh, that uh, 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 we cannot actually, let, at this stage, let us say that we want to f see if we can find a coherent way of approaching the question, right? I mean, explore it. And the, uh, but anyway, uh, where were we now? That the, the thing did not work properly uh, when we uh, it became incoherent. You see, and on the other hand, we can say we must be careful not to dismiss incoherence altogether, because we're bound to become incoherent. <laughs> you see, the question is only, what is our attitude to incoherence? If we defend ourselves against acknowledging that we are incoherent, then this. Uh, causes trouble, right? Hmm? Uh, now, therefore, incoherence is part of learning. Right? We learn that we are incoherent and then we learn something else. And, and we don't reach absolute coherence. We are constantly moving, right? Hmm? And our, uh, so we have a question of language there, which we'll have to come to as well. But that's part of thought, right? Uh, part of the problem of thought has been that it has developed the notion of absolute, it had to, and yet that notion of absolute has uh, a paradox in it which has not been resolved, right? Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, the, uh, or maybe intrinsic, I don't know, you see, uh, for all we know. Now, uh, the, uh, okay, so we're back on the question of the concrete, right? The concrete process of meaning of the mind you see, what is it? <laughs> you see, we can't put our finger on it, right? It's, it's entirely subtle, right? Elusive. But it, it's there. <laughs> you see, uh, now one of the, you can get a clue to this by considering what Polanyi has called tacit knowledge. That when, for example, you ride a bicycle, you have a countless little movements by which you keep it in balance. You can't describe them or put your finger on them. I mean, if you tried to describe them, you would fall, right? <laughs> You see, you, you simply do it. Now, it, you can't say where it starts from or anything, you see. Now, uh, <clears throat> it may have countless sources. Now, uh, however, you turn in the direction in which you fall, and there's a formula you can calculate from physics that the, the angle of tilt and the angle of turn must be related by some formula, that one is the square of the other. But that, that, that's, you satisfy that if you're riding the bicycle properly, but you're not thinking about it while you're riding. So you don't use it to ride the bicycle, right? Hmm. Now, uh, okay, so I think we all realize that we do almost everything by tacit knowledge, right? Now I ask a question, how do you think? I want to think, you see, I have a problem to solve, right? So will you give me directions how to think, right? I mean, what shall I do? <laughs> you see, what can I do? You see. I, I, I use tacit knowledge of how to think in thinking, right? right? Uh, now, if I'm going to claim that it's even more subtle than riding the bicycle. Hmm? So, that tacit process is what happens when you're thinking. Now, if you're doing it properly, your thoughts will follow a logical order, just as your bicycle will satisfy the formula, right? You see, so, but I, if you try to impose the logical order, that is not the right way to think. Hmm? People, however, do, many people believe that the right way to think is to impose a logical order. That, that <laughs> and in fact, people in artificial intelligence think that they can cover the whole of thinking by just uh, working it out on some kind of program, you know, a very complex, infinite program. Now. Uh, but I, I suggest that thinking is a subtle uh, movement, 
uh, and uh, meaning, whatever it is, is even more subtle. <laughs> but it, it is the concrete reality of the process. In other words, that that, that is what's happening to produce, uh, and, the, and the, the, the function of this concrete process of thinking is to produce abstractions as the function of the factor is to produce products, right? <laughs> so, we normally think of meaning as something produced by thought. Mm -hmm. You're suggesting otherwise. Yes, I think meaning is... Uh, it can be uh, 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 produced from thought, but uh, more generally it isn't, right? You know, thought contributes. Eh? But even thought is a concrete process which we cannot get hold of. You know, we, we know that thought will have electric currents. You know, people have made measurements, chemical changes, the blood moves in the brain, but that isn't the, whole, uh, that isn't the essential point, right? I was just wondering, is there, if we accept that rode bicycles the way we thought, we'd be crashing all over the place, apparently. <laughs> but it seems as though then our tacit knowledge about think we think that our tacit knowledge about thinking is correct. Yeah. There seem to be some very serious mistakes in our tacit knowledge about thinking. Is that, we don't seem to be know that or be aware of it. We yes. assume that it's correct as we're thinking and talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the basic mistakes which has developed with the human race. You see, people began by just thinking, you know. <laughs> as you breathe, you think, uh, you know, you don't... Uh, then, but then people began to develop thoughts about how they think, right? <laughs> now, these thoughts were often incorrect and led to, mis uh, to uh, confusion, to incoherence. Huh? See, the thought about your thinking can affect your thinking, right? Can you give an example of a thought about thinking that is possibly... <coughs> well, uh, well, for example, uh, you should be a right-thinking person who agrees with your community, <laughs> right? You know, with all the people around you. You see, uh, saying uh, the community expects you to be a right-thinking person who has the right, correct opinions. And you've, you've got to impose them. You see, if you're not right, we've got to impose it. Right? We've got to use force. And, you know, that's going to affect thinking profoundly. Is that clear? It will induce a lot of fear and conflict. And, hmm? Or else if you think, I must think logically by following the rules, that will get in your way, right? Is it something that gets in the way of what they call positive thinking? Because we say something that the gates, and right away there's a number of people, especially now with the new age, that tells you that's your negativity. What? Negativity, well, they yeah. say. So you don't have a positive thinking. But is that positive thinking as well something that gets in the way of thinking? Well, that's. I think that uh, all those things get in the way. You see. If somebody says engage solely in positive thinking, well, that's a rule that you've set up which may get in the way, you see, of, uh, the, the, of this uh, tacit process which really does it right. Huh? I apologize for the word right, but it does it <laughs> coherently, right? <laughs> the, uh, uh, now, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, see, somebody tells you, you think only positively. Somebody else says, no, think negatively. <laughs> You know, you must watch out for all the mistakes and so on, right? But you really need to do both. Huh? Or if somebody else says, pull yourself together, you say, cheer up, <laughs> right? They're affecting your thinking. They're telling you to think thoughts that'll do that, aren't they? Hmm? Now, that may not make much sense. You see, you may have a lot of thoughts that are pulling you apart, <laughs> depressing you and so on, and you're not really facing them, you see. Hmm? You see, there, the human, human race is full of traditional ways by which thought thinks about how it should work, right? Hmm? Aren't essentially yeah. most organized religions based on yeah. that? Yes, I mean, think God, you know, think uh, obedient, fear of God, obedience to God, right? Uh, put God first, you know. There are various ways which, by which you're 
if you think, you will then, the, the suggestion is you will bring the rest to, into harmony, right? Hmm. Well, the image seniors have this sign, you just said think. <laughs> <laughs> think. Well, it's all right. But, but you see, what does it mean is the question, right? <laughs> You know, the, the word think has also all these meanings that have been developed, right? Hmm. Yeah. Well, we should have a break now, I think. I don't know, 15. <laughs> yes, I think. Right. Uh, everybody can think about this in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> hmm.